Before we get started, we wanted to thank Matchstick Golf for being our first title sponsor. Matchstick is a custom designer of ball markers based in Portland, Oregon, that was born out of its founder getting sick and tired of trying to find cool ball markers that weren't huge, heavy poker chips that didn't cost $300 on eBay. Matchstick's markers include the one-eyed alligator from Happy Gilmore, a stack of cash that will have you putting for dough. Right now, Matchstick is offering 15% off your first order at matchstickgolf.com with the code MUNICIPALS. So head on over to matchstickgolf.com, enter MUNICIPALS at checkout, tell them Big C in Ashton sent you. Up next, you'll be listening to part one of our wonderful conversation with award-winning New York Times bestselling author Tom Coyne. Because he had so many cool stories and intuitive insights to share with us, we decided to share our chat with him in two parts. Without any more delay, please enjoy our conversation with the one and only Tom Coyne. How hard did you push it? Till I black out? Yes. Numerous times, yes. Happening Municipals, this is Big C and Ashton. We have a very special guest with us tonight, or today, wherever you guys are listening. So we have New York Times bestseller, Paper Tiger, Course Called Scotland, Course Called Ireland, and his newest release, very, very good book, me and Ashton both. I've read it twice so far, Ashton's read through it and listen through it, A Course Called America. We have Tom Coyne. What's happening, my man? Hey, Big Chris. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Thanks for the kind words as well. Absolutely. Yeah, we're just just stoked to have you here, for sure. So am I, talking to you out on the West Coast, to my municipals. No, it's... um, yeah, no, thanks for thanks for reading and thanks for having me on. So looking forward to what we're going to get into. Yes, sir. Well, before we kind of get into the, the meat of tonight, I mean, Tom, you know, when we emailed you, we, we kind of felt bad because we know you're in the middle of like the world's biggest heater, you know, your last day at St. Joe's combined with the book release, come out of the book release party, combined with oh, yeah. uh, family vacation, combined with Ireland. So how have the last couple months been for you? I'm sure certainly a whirlwind. That's right. Yeah, we've been trying to do this for a little bit. Um because, yeah, it was pretty crazy. From May onward, it's been pretty nuts. I, I guess the book came out end of May, May 25th. Book launch party was May 24th. So since then, I, I th- things haven't really stopped. They've, they've sort of stopped now for a little bit. But, you know, we had the party and then I went on the road doing events promoting the book. Um golf go, visiting golf clubs and doing speaking events um book signings uh whatever anyone that you know invited me and was willing to buy x number of books and said for you know their their members or golfers or whatever i said great um i said probably said yes too many times because my calendar just like literally my summer was it got it was kind of a joke i i could i looked at it and i couldn't there just like was not a day if you asked me like can you play golf that day like i was completely um completely overbooked so it was almost like reliving the um i mean it's a great problem to have and that's why i i say yes to everything because you know a year from now nobody might want to talk to me so you know while the iron's hot if you will um so it was yeah busy summer rolled right into um some travel international travel which we weren't sure whether it was going to happen or not you know, following the COVID situation and, and getting in and out of Europe and all that stuff. But we were able to do um, uh, the Coin Cup, which is a trip we do every year for friends and, and readers. And anyone who signs up is in, in, welcome to welcome to come. And uh, so we did that in the southwest of Ireland for about 10 days and then did a trip with um, all the Murray brothers um, who was on the trip, Joel, Bill, uh johnny and andy were and their sons and cousins so 20 murrays in ireland which was pretty nuts so we did that for 10 days 
and uh, I lived to tell the tale. So I got home, and I'm now I'm just trying to organize my life, and actually have, and had a lot of travel scheduled for the fall. The fall was actually like just as crazy as the summer, but I've tried to push, and people have been very understanding. I've been pushing all of that stuff, most of those events into the spring um, for my own sanity, and also uh, just trying to cut down on the travel. My kids don't have the vaccine yet, so we're if I'm moving around too much, um, they have to stay out of school. So it's all that stuff is, we thought it was over, but it's not. So, um, I'm trying to, trying to deal and, uh, even as a vaccinated person. So, um, it's been, so hanging out some more, the good news, spending more time at home. So that's been nice. And I can come on your podcast. (laughs) That's amazing. Well, I feel like we'd be remiss to ask, how was it to play golf with 20 Murray's? Like, yeah. I That's mean, it had to have been one of the funniest experiences ever. It, you know, it was. It, there were a lot of laughs. Um, it was. It, it was pretty great. I mean, there's also you know there's a certain amount of like pressure or stress that one feels when you've designed. You know, help. I, and I had great help from my friend Tom Kennedy, Experience Ireland, and we had help from Tourism Ireland, and so there were like other parties involved. But at the end of the day, it was like myself who went to like Brian and Bill and the brothers and and said, Hey, I'll build you a golf trip. It was originally supposed to be part of Bill was going over to play in the JP McManus pro-am at, at Adair Manor. And he, we talked about, you know, if you want to do a week before or after, you know, obviously I know a little something about golf in Ireland, I'll put a trip together, et cetera. So you feel a fair amount of pressure that, one everyone's having fun that it's going well that they're being you know received everything's going just the right way so as as fun as it was you know my nature is to sort of stress about like um you know are we on time are we this are we that you know that that kind of stuff so it was a blast it was you know certainly an experience where every once in a while i would um look around and just be like this is crazy Like, I can't believe that, you know, this is what I'm doing today. Um, Along with them, Billy Collins and his wife, Susanna, joined us. And Billy Collins is the U.S. Poet Laureate, who's a friend and a great golfer and and a friend of the Murray. So he joined us, too. And, you know, we're driving through Ireland. We visit W.B. Yeats's grave and Billy gets out and does a poetry reading at the gravesite. And I'm just looking around and I'm like, this is like not i'm the luckiest dude in the world and that didn't even have to do with golf so just cool stuff like that happened um it it was pretty amazing to see i thought i was like used to or in my head had some notion like i've been around you know some tour players or famous people and you know and you know people wanting autographs not from me but from people that 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 i've been around and i so i thought i was like i knew what like celebrity looked like um but it's Bill Murray is a whole other thing. Um, the 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 crowds, the people wanting pictures and autographs, and just a little and, and some of his time. Um, I, I frankly I don't know how he does it, and he does it with a lot of class and grace, and he's funny and charming and all that. Um, so we were two hours late for everything because it took two hours. There's just an extra half an hour anytime the bus stopped because. Sure people came and um wanted to uh you know something to do with bill murray and um so that was you know we got used to it it was we were all murray time which meant that we get to dinner about 10 o'clock every night (laughs) and uh so it was fun it was exhausting uh and we live to tell the tale. We got a lot of footage, and we're going to put it together into some stuff that, that people will be able to watch eventually whenever we get enough time to, to sort of get that sorted. So, Well, that was that reminds me. There were so many great anecdotes in the book, but I think one thing that I, I – I, as Chris said, I'm an audiobook fan, so – I was making dinner and I laughed out loud when you were talking about, you know, it's like, hey, do you want a massage? And then, you know, the masa- the masseuse was like, you know, hey, can I take a picture? You know, do you get to happen all the time? But the story of you guys getting a massage and her reaction to giving Bill Murray a massage, I was, I like literally laughed out loud in my kitchen hearing that, that, that story. Yeah, that was a, well, that was a pretty great weekend. And <laughs> it sounded uh, really yeah, fun. playing Prairie Dunes with, with Brian and Bill Murray and, and you know him somehow managing to get a massage now 
even knowing that and having had that experience, I was still amazed by how often on our Ireland trip, the Murrays talked about massages, getting massages, comparing massages. Are we going to be able to get one in this town? Do we have time for one today? Now, in fairness, like they're not spring chickens and I was golfing the hell out of them. I mean, I was running them hard on this itinerary. So people were sore um, and, and were tired and, and, and fair enough. They, they were asking, you know, can we get massages? And, and Bill was having like his knee was bothering him a little bit and Andy's back was bothering him. So, yeah, I mean, at some point they found an acupuncturist in like in the west of Ireland and they found, I you know, Thai massage in Galway, which according to them is like the most superior form of massage. Um, I guess it's very, it's like not even enjoyable, but it has the most, um, they kill you. They kill you, apparently. Uh, but the results are the most dramatic. So they were, you know, we're driving around in, like, these rural towns. And they're like, yeah, you think they have Thai massage? And I'm like, Bill, I, I don't think they have running water. Like, uh, you know, no, there's no time. We're not having Thai massage today. We're here to golf. So, yeah, that became like a running, you know, this um, – there was a few, th- you know, learning a lot about the Murray family and their dynamics and the, and the trip was, was really part of the fun. And they're just great people, really smart, really into music and, uh, and very knowledgeable about, um, about massage. So, so there you go <laughs> of the athletic variety. I, I may, I may re- remind one, they were not one for Swedish or just, you know, it was all very hardcore therapeutic stuff that they, but, uh, you know, they, they knew, um, how to get themselves feeling, you know, better and ready for, uh, ready for golf the next day, which, which was not always easy. So I, I want to ask so my favorite story with Bill Murray. I used to go to the at t pro-am at Pebble beach yearly with my, with my family. And there was one year Bill was playing out there and he actually got disqualified in, I think it was the third third day because he went and stole an ice cream truck and brought it onto the course and started handing out free ice cream to everybody. (laughs) And so then they just, the, you know, PGA and everybody involved in that, that's kind of a whole no, no there in the middle of a round. So they disqualified him and he, I don't think he came back for many years after that. I don't know what happened there, but with, with that, was there any detours, like Bill Murray-style detours that happened on the trip? He's definitely spontaneous. Yeah. Um, I'm not surprised that, um, that that happened. And it was like when people would pose for pictures, like he doesn't um, like to do th- – it seemed – at least I'm. this is my impression, that he doesn't just seem – if you want to pose for a picture – he just doesn't do like the ordinary easy stuff because, you know, people want to be surprised and they want to laugh and they want something Bill Murray. So, you know, he'll do something like, you know, he'll he'll grab um, a potted plant and put it on your head. He'll Bill grab a mannequin and and, and put that between you and, and pose with that because just because it's weird and different and funny. So he was doing. Yeah, there was a lot of spontaneous stuff. Um, he didn't hijack any cars or, or do stuff like that. At one point, like we, we finished at Rasa Pena. And um, and we played the new Doak course, which is extraordinary, by the way. Um, the St. Patrick's Links in Donegal, and we're all hanging around. We're like, kind of, again, we're really late for the next spot, and like, well, where's you know, where's Bill? And um, you know, usually it was they were signing autographs, or something, but there was no one around. Um, and like, oh, he jumped in the he jumped in the car with his caddy, and they took off. Like the after after golf, like where anyone know where they went? I'm like, nope, no idea. Don't know when he's gonna be back. Doesn't have his phone. Don't know where they went. And uh, and so we're just hanging out, waiting for um, Bill to come back. Because uh, his caddy was like, hey, I'll sh-. I guess apparently his caddy was like, I'll drive you around town and show you Rasa Pena and 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 the t- and Downings and the town and all that. So um, that that's where he went. Um, but he'd show up and like in the morning with a you know, the fruit that was in his hotel room or the cho- a box of chocolates. Like there were lots of gifts. Like when you're traveling with Bill Murray, you get lots of stuff. Um, so he'd show up with like the box of chocolates and he'd walk around, he'd walk into the kitchen and give it to the staff. He'd go and give, give it to the, the, the guys in the bag room or the, uh, in the pro shop. And that was kind of cool to just watch him interact with people. He was most comfortable with people. It seemed to me, uh, that were working at places like he always made time to take pictures with the staff um 
because they were probably the only people in the place that didn't want something from him. And I think he liked that. And why wouldn't you, you know? Um, so, yeah, it was pretty cool. But, you know, the other brothers are, you know, they, they, they're a great group. They really look out for each other. There are a lot of Murrays, and they're very tight. And, uh, you know, they grew up in a house with um, pretty much raised by their mom. Their dad died when they were young. So they're just – they're a tight group, and it's pretty cool to see them interact and see the cousins interact. And um, it, it was very uh, – it was just cool to see a family like who you'd think wouldn't be normal, you know, um, be normal. I mean, they're funny, funnier than most families. Um, but, you know, they're just uh, – they're just really good guys and that was that was the best part of the trip yeah that's amazing and we're gonna get kind of more to some of our topics but have to ask like so how was that dough course oh it's great man it's really 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 good um it's it's a piece of property and i just i just did a pretty long piece about it for the golfer's journal and not about so much the course but about Rasa Pena itself as a family operated and owned hotel that has golf courses by old Tom Morris, uh, Pat Ruddy, who is sort of the, the king of golf, the, the, one of the current kings of architecture in Ireland, and um, and Tom Doak, which is sort of a, you know, a, a Mount Rushmore of, of, of design that you wouldn't see equaled anywhere in Ireland. So, um, you know, this, this family-run hotel in a very remote part of the country that people wouldn't, for a long time, wouldn't go to, you know, because of... Uh, their impressions of, of what was going on in Northern Ireland, um, even though Donegal is in the Republic, but it was still like just a place like you just didn't go above, you didn't go north of Galway. So for them to now have these golf courses, to have a five-star hotel, to um, to have the best, you know, some of the best links in, in the world, it's a pretty awesome story. And it's, and it's a great family story. And so so that's what I've been actually working on since I got back. And uh, so as for the course itself, I mean, Doak just did, knocked it out of the park. He just did a great a great job. He created something that is like at the same time that feels very traditionally Irish and, and traditionally linksy, but it has things that you're not going to find elsewhere. It has the the bunker the bunkers feel a little bit different than what you find elsewhere in Ireland. There's a lot of blown out sort of cool natural very rugged bunkering um and the greens the, the where the greens start and the fairways end like it is sort of unclear which just get, feels very natural you can really play the ball through the ground and along the ground fairways very generous but the green complexes and the, and the undulation make it they can make it as hard as they want to um and they can make it as easy as they want to it's a really really good visitors golf course they're gonna i think they're gonna kill it i think it's gonna be Americans favorite links for a lot of Americans it'll be their favorite links because it's a place where you're not you can lose some balls but you can also really enjoy yourself and, and not lose some balls and if you can somehow if you master putting from 50 yards away um, if that's your thing you, you can do it there and it's uh, it's pretty fun it's great they're gonna they're gonna kill it the, the, I'm curious, this um, obviously isn't the benchmark of a good golf course, but hearing about the five-star hotel and some of the amenities, do you know if did they build that with a Ryder Cup in mind, or is it not that kind of a place? It's too it's too remote to get a Ryder Cup, um, though you, I, I'd say they're, you know, Donegal is too remote to have anything, but they had an Irish Open in 2018, I believe, so they've had the European Tour there, but I think that's about as big as they'll get until they get I don't know if someday they get an airport that's closer. It's just not easy to get to. It's it's three and a half hours from Dublin Airport, probably four hours from Shannon, um, uh, three hours from Belfast. So there's just just doesn't have the infrastructure or the uh, or the airport to. I mean, they have a regional local airport, but I've never known anyone that's flown into it. So um, what Adair, you know, Ireland is getting the 2027 Ryder Cup. And Adair has um, the – it has Shannon Airport right there, a major international airport. Um, it has the grounds, the space, the property, the, the hotel. What what they wouldn't have at Ross Pena either is like there's nowhere for you to walk. Um, it's the tricky thing about having golf on, on crazy – 
um, links courses. It's like what happened to Chambers Bay. You know, everyone walked out there and broke their ankles. You know, like like people literally did. The spectators are like, I'll, I'll, I'll try to go over there, and then you're walking through these crazy dunescapes, and that's more like what Ross Penn is like. I, I don't know how where people would walk because it's a, it's like golf on the moon. It's a really it's a really lunar um, undulating kind of experience, which is cool. Um, Adair is much more like an Augusta experience, and it's it's that. It, it feels like it. It's that pure. That's going to be fun. I mean, but it's a bummer to like have these Ryder Cups in Europe and have them at American style courses. But, um, and then they're having, then Whistling Straits is supposed to be like uh, an Irish golf course in America, and that's where we're having the Ryder Cup. But it's really not. It's it's way too. It's not. It's not firm enough to to sort of play that way. But it's much more of a target course with where you have to hit it a million miles. But um. Yeah, so that's going to be fun. Yeah. Yeah, and it was funny when I was just watching recently, watched uh, your trip with the Knowing Up Boys, and it's like, it's funny how it dare, both in the weather and the layout, it's like one of these things is not like the other. I think Solly's quote was, if you could ever have a course, there's, <laughs> what would you do without ever having a bad lie? What would it look like? And, you know, certainly that's not normally Lynx golf, but no, it definitely looks like if you can just kind of stomach the fact that it's, you know, quote, not Irish golf in its own way, I think that's going to be an incredible venue to watch those guys out there. Yeah, I mean, it's Irish in a different way. It's it's an inland golf course. It's Irish in that, the I mean, the building is is has incredible history to it and the Irish welcome and all that other stuff, but it's not Irish links um, mm-hmm. for sure. But it's going to be awesome. I, I mean, Adair Manor is, um, you know – I'm, I obviously I write about links courses. I'm, it's my favorite sort of golf on the planet, but I would not. I mean, you tell me I have a chance to play Darren Manor and I'd run. Um, I I love it. Uh, and and tell me I could stay there. Well, <laughs> you know I don't know if there's any other place I'd rather stay. Um, I mean, top five in the world for me is is, is wow. places to stay and and play some golf. It's just uh, J P McManus. You know, did not. Uh, did not spare anything in making this just sort of this dream this dream spot so highly recommend yeah it's neither one of us have played golf outside of the u.s so uh, oh come on we're, 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 we're getting we're, there we're, we're in we our early come, 30s so it, it's it's right. right out of college getting into getting in jobs now it's travel time for us so there you go we got to come on a coin cup we'll take you to uh coin golf i just started a new travel brand as I plug it here. I love that. Do it. Yeah. So I figured, you know, like I've done Ireland, Scotland, and America now. And I get all this email from people asking, like, where should I go in Ireland? Where should I go in Scotland? And I yeah. would write, like, these, like, three-page emails because I just enjoy <laughs> it. And I have all this useless information in my head. And um, and then I figured, I'm like, what? maybe I should get paid for that. Um, so, <laughs> so we're going to give that a shot. Uh, so, yeah, there'll be more... Uh, more coin golf trips coming up folks and uh, you should jump on one it's gonna be fun oh we definitely will have to get on one of those all right um, cool that intrigues me like crazy because one thing i do in my personal time and i'm kind of a little bit of a psychopath in this aspect is i kind of have maps and lists and spreadsheets of courses across the united states of different public tracks that you know i've either heard through people or read through you know golfers journal or you know listening to your podcast or a- any different median and i've just added them to all these lists and so i'm kind of in the same boat where three years ago i i went out to kind of play every public track on the west coast uh which is oh, just wow. a bit over a thousand public courses out here and i have gotten to about 392 of them Good for you, man. That's impressive. Wow. Yeah. Oh, you're you're a golfer after my own heart. Um, that's very cool. I like that as a as an endeavor. So, but I mean, where do you draw the line? Like, so you have the coastal states, I guess. Yeah. So it, it's just the three states that run along the coast. So California, right. Oregon, Washington. Of uh, yeah, eventually, that seems fair. you know, I'll have a whole list and and make up of the entire United States of what I kind of want to tackle. I don't think I can. I don't think there's enough time in anybody's lifetime that could probably play every single public course across the United States. No, I just, don't. Don't don't try to. You're not gonna try to get that. <laughs> but very, there, there's very some like, lonely life. Yes. Yeah. 
Well, we'll leave that up to Matt Cardis and uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, him with the uh, golf in your state. But it's uh, it's something that I've just created that I I will spread across the United States. But I do want to complete at least the three states on, on the West Coast at at some point in my life. And where I kind of cut it off is resort courses. So anything that's accessible to the public. So mm-hmm. if I can pay to get in, I consider it. Um, I consider it a public accessible course, and that's from par three courses all the way up to your championship style courses. So where does Pebble Beach lie then? Because it's a resort course, but anymore it seems like you have to you have to stay there, right? So loophole for me. So yeah. I got I got that knocked off the list during COVID because during COVID they were allowing they were doing discounted rates to play, which. Discounted for Pebble Beach was three hundred and fifty dollars to go out it's and play. Pretty good, so incredible deal. Yeah. So I actually, you know, took that up, went out there with a couple buddies, and knocked off every course in the resort within like a two week span. Damn, that's pretty good. So and that's that was that's a, a good chunk of change too. It it was luckily Unless the government you at got that it. point was paying us to play golf. Oh yeah, exactly. That's true. Exactly. But you got it. The key, Chris, is that you this endeavor of yours becomes, you know, more people know about it and then they stop making you pay for it. <laughs> that's 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 where I would recommend getting getting to that point to be to become America's guest. Um, you know, I followed in the footsteps of 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 many other um, freeloading golfers that have that have inspired me over the years. Um, I won't use their names here, uh, but have, have under the guise of media or book related or film related projects have scored free golf, um, here, there and everywhere. So that's the key. Once you, you know, in these endeavors that you turn it into something where it's like, Hey, uh, I'm going to come out and give you some exposure X, Y, and Z. All I need is a tea time. So, you know, because otherwise it's, it's damn expensive to play that much golf. So I will say uh, probably about 20, 30% of it has been covered by the golf courses good, for exposure good. through, you know, our social media channels, talking <clears throat> on our podcast, doing reviews, anything like that. So I, I have taken a little bit of that. I reach out through Instagram or email the general managers, kind of letting them know that I'm planning on coming out. And I've had a lot of courses be extremely gracious on, on inviting us out. So yeah that's good golf clubs are good like that they are and, and you know if you're doing something you're not just some dude who hey i got a blog can i uh can i have some free golf um you know you're what you're doing that's pretty cool so i'm glad they're doing that yeah and the experiences and the people that you get to meet through those avenues have been really really incredible as well and a lot of the rule courses that i necessarily wouldn't go to i i've made the drive out because they have sent the invite my way so you know, I've been able to reach out to great courses like the Peninsula Golf Course uh, or Golf Club, which is just in Port Angeles, Washington. Mm. And you can see all of Victoria, Canada from the entire course. You can see Russia from there? You might be able to on a clear day. That's crazy. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, I should have put that on my list. But that's how I ended up going. The same deal. Like a lot of the courses in a course called America – it was the, the nature of the invitation, right? Like one that you got invited and you're like, okay, cool. I don't have to beg my way onto the golf course or I don't have to spend $300. Um, and if someone's excited to have you there, that just creates like you're excited, right? And you're enthusiastic going into it. So it just creates like the right vibe and, and, and you know, you're going to meet someone there. You're going to have someone to play with. It's, you know, you're going to have fun. There's enthusiasm. There's all that stuff. It's not just, you're not just like checking a box. So uh, yeah, I'm the same way. I'm very influenced by the fact, like if someone reaches out and invites me, um, somewhere to play, uh, that, that sounds interesting. Like I'll, I'll, if I can do it, I say yes more than more than i well now my calendar is not so friendly but when my calendar was friendlier um i was at god i said yes all the time you know and that and that's and those are great experiences and and like you said it's the people that you meet and the relationships that come out of that it's it's amazing 
and that's one thing that I do going into them as well is I always make sure that I I ask to play with either a general manager, somebody that works in the pro shop, a superintendent, anybody that's on the grounds all the time that I can kind of pick their brain through the entire uh, round because I really love to know the story, history behind the course that invites me out. And then also just the quirks and what keeps things going day to day. Mm-hmm. Cause that's a big thing I think that doesn't get shine a, a lot of light shined on it is what it takes to kind of keep these courses to be able f- to have us go out there for 40, 50 bucks at a public track and experience, you know, a great round every time we come out and, and those type of things. So those, those are what really, you know, drive me to keep going to all these courses as well. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. There's a lot that goes into it. So it's, it's, um, when you find a great place that you get, that people can afford to play and that's in good enough shape and, um, and especially if you never heard of it, uh, you always want to know like, okay, this place, well, it, what always stands out to me is like this place means a lot to somebody and usually it's a lot of people and so it's like all right who are those people and i want to meet them and and i want to know their deal you know like when i went in the book to um amsterdam new york and played them their muni so in my office here just around the corner you can't see it but there's a huge banner on the ceiling that says welcome to our municipal and it has the seal of the city of Amsterdam and my logo, whatever. Um, and I'm, it's like a prized thing that they made that banner of welcoming me to their munis, to their to their muni, and the pride that they had in that golf course, how good it was, um, how I played with a guy who was third generation playing at the golf course, Mike, my friend Mike. And, you know, that his grandfather had played there and that his son was going to play there and was already playing there. You know, that, that, that stuff is, um, you know, that's why you travel. Um, and that's why you, 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 when someone just says, Hey, come, when a firefighter sends you an email and says, Hey, you want to come to my Muni in the middle of New York, convenient to, to nothing. Um, you say, yes, I can't always say yes, but that I'm really fortunate that I did with that one. That's that's something I love because that was another question I kind of had listed here that kind of ties into that. Um, like when getting into writing Course Called America, what is something that was a happy surprise? And then on the other hand, what was a letdown on the state of golf in America that you kind of hmm. came across? Yeah, lots of surprises um, that... Uh... So the Amsterdam Muni, great surprise. Res golf in the Navajo Nation, tremendous surprise. You know, playing this nine hole golf course um, in the Navajo Nation that was free, didn't have any grass on it, but was still incredibly fun and playable, was handmade, was there for the community, was, you know, and, and the friendships that I made there and the stories that I learned about the people behind it and the people who use it. I mean, that, that stuff was just like a. Um, I still get, you know, this wave of gratitude just thinking about the time that I got to spend there. Um, so that was incredibly special. Um, the big su- surprise was how the project and the grew and was received by people as it was going along and that there it, it sort of gained a little bit of a following so that I could show up somewhere and I could say on Twitter, hey, I need... I have room for two tomorrow. If you can, if anyone wants to join me in Los Angeles or, or Oregon or wherever I was and, um, and 20 people would show up, you know, and that was always, and that could be an issue with the tea time, but we could figure that out. Um, but the fact that people were willing to come spend some time or take a day off to come play golf with some wandering golfer dude who, who's not famous, um, but is just really trying to passionate about the game and they want to meet someone who loves golf as much as they do. So that to me was an awesome surprise that that kept happening. And I just kept meeting new people who were so good. Like I was waiting for the assholes, you know, and, and maybe golf is like, I don't know, maybe it's like self-selecting in that, 
and maybe it's because of the books or the golfer's journal or whatever that it sort of weeds out some of the assholes that like they wouldn't you know, i guess if you hated one of my books you wouldn't like go out of your way to meet me right so um and and maybe that mean it means you have a certain perspective on golf that we're going to get along so I don't, I don't know but just everyone was good and cool and chilled out and got along and and it was everywhere and and so that was a great surprise like you know i i left and i'm heading off into this america where you think we're like in the, at the at the precipice you know we're we're standing we're staring into the abyss it's it, it's a it's an apocalypse out there it sounds like the end of days in america if you're just watching the news and then to get out there and find out that you know what people are like pretty cool and um generally like everyone's getting along and we're having a good time now yeah, maybe that's because it's it was golf, or maybe it's because it, you know, I, I, again it was a self-selecting group. I don't know, um, but it was we were we were okay. Like it, it, it was this, this reassuring feeling as I traveled. Um, I guess disappointments would be that um, there were like no disappointments from like an architectural or like golf experience standpoint. I mean, I, I have this feeling I'm, I'm pretty soft when it comes to like judging golf courses or getting nasty about golf courses because i generally don't i feel like like golf to me is like pizza like even when it's bad it's still pretty good right um like they say that about pizza and sex right like it's it's yeah it's still still all right you know <laughs> like so absolutely right like so you know it's, it's still golfing um and that's at the end of the day that's and i'm and and I don't like to throw courses under the bus either because if there's a course where someone's busting their ass to try and keep it going. So that, that, that you know, even if, even if it's a mess, um, I think that the, some of the things that we could, that I saw that could be better. Um, one, like I didn't play with as many, like I did play with a lot. I probably played with more women than I thought I was going to, but not as many as I would like to. I probably played, I, I, I was able to like, without, like saying like this is the goal of the trip to go like find uh to play with more female golfers because i don't play with that many in my regular life or um to play with more minority golfers um because i wanted like show that we that that's a growing demographic in in american golf like that wasn't something that i was necessarily setting out to do in the book um but it, it i would i did and and that and that's and that was that was good, but it could have been better. It could have been a lot better, actually. And I think that relates to my overall sort of critique of American golf, is that it's just too damn buttoned up and private. Um, and that's, you know, and that's a point that I I've made in all my books. And and that goes to the the point that yes, in Ireland and Scotland that those are my first two adventures and the countries that I'd got really from a golf standpoint knew better than my own. And those are countries where you can play any golf course, maybe aside from like one in Scotland, any golf course, if you have a handicap and a credit card and a flexible schedule, cause they wouldn't necessarily, not all of them would have visitor tea times every day, but they're, they have members, they have memberships, they have member competitions, but they also welcome visitors to come and spend a lot of money and play their golf course and underwrite their expenses and make it cheaper for them to belong there. And it just makes sense. Golf, you know, private, a private golf course with visitor tee times can work. Um, but it just never, and as I explain in the book, there's like a lot of history behind that in America and it, it's, it just never worked. And it's not how golf came to America. Golf came to America as a game behind in the country club movement, which was, you know, to put these British games behind closed doors to keep them away from these filthy immigrants and this dirt and this new money and all that stuff. So it's, it's kind of unfortunate. So our country club model is one that is uh, still everywhere and still sucks. And it really sucks. And I, I belong to one because i have to because i live in philadelphia and you can't golf every saturday if, if you don't and it's just you know um and uh hey, i'd love to have visitor tea times and pay half the dues that i have to pay you know what i mean um god you belong to bally bunny and for a thousand bucks a year like are you kidding me top five in the world whatever so um or maybe it's more than that now but it wasn't when i was writing the america when i was writing the book so yeah that whole argument about uh, accessibility is still holding us back our fear of the unwashed golfer coming to our golf club 
So yeah. it, go for it, Ashton. Yeah, well, I was just going to say, I mean, you could probably guess from, you know, our, our name, but I mean, that's the whole reason we wanted to do this. Because, I mean, look, Chris and I have both played our fair share of, of private courses. There's private courses we love a ton. Mm-hmm. But I think for both of us, you know, really trying to shine a light on some of these courses, you know, places where, as you said, matter to a lot of people. Like there's a place in Petaluma I talk about all the time. It's like Rooster Run. If you come out and you want to play golf, I'm probably not going to take you to Rooster Run. But if it's like, okay, Saturday, I got dinner plans. What's going to have like good greens? It's going to charge me like 40 bucks. I'm going to get in and out enough. Like that is like a staple. It's like a staple diet, you know? Yeah. And so the whole idea for this podcast is just trying to to shed light on some of these places. Cause I think for me, the most gratifying thing is like, you know, we have no followers. I don't even know if anybody listens to this, but once in a while we get a DM from someone who's like, Hey, I was looking to play somewhere and I didn't know about X course. I went out there and I thank you for letting me know about that course. That's awesome. You know? Yeah. And I think that's for us what we're trying to illuminate. And even more for me is like, I'm just kind of the conduit to Chris because I'm new to the West coast. I mean, I'm from the East coast originally. I love the Bay area, but I don't have 9,000 golf courses in my Rolodex like Chris, but I think just people who, you know, especially people in the last year are like, hey, I'm new to golf. I don't even know what to wear much less where to play. It's like, well, the least we can do is help you understand, like, here's a good course where you're not going to get screwed over on price. Everyone's going to play quickly enough. You can get home in a reasonable amount of time. Um, you know, and I think that's kind of what the community we're trying to put out there so that people can just find good places that, you know, are not buttoned up, are accessible and just you know, the nice, friendly people who are like, hey, we just want you to come play our course. And, you know, mm-hmm. if you want a beer while you're here, buy one and just go have a good time, you know? Absolutely. And, you know, I was fortunate to find, like, there was more of that um, the farther I sort of moved away from the East Coast and, and from, like, so, you know, the Philly, Philly, Boston, New York scenes, very private. And that's because the golf's very old. It's old here. It's, not, you know, some of the older stuff. But getting out into... um like Minnesota had some really good courses that uh, like Minneapolis area. Like I was like, they had a decent public scene and Michigan had some accessibility that was pretty cool. And, um, actually central Pennsylvania was much better than Philadelphia. And then, um, there were parts of new England that had some, had some real gems. Uh, so they're there, but I think, like you said, they need to be highlighted because we talk about like when people think about where do I want to go play? they generally think of rankings lists or think of places they might have seen where the pj tour went or something you know like um that's generally where because where else how else you're going to know about golf courses i mean that's generally where most people's rolodex if you will that's, that's where it is that's what they've heard of um and even if you look at like the top hundred, you can play or whatever. That there's still, you can play them, but they're pretty expensive. Most of them are pretty damn expensive. Um, so to have a resource, um, and I guess like Sugarloaf has done something in that regard. Um, you know, trying to peg, put together a map of courses um, where they're accessible in public and 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 that kind of thing. I think that's fantastic. And um, and I could have used more of that. Um, I think I, I, I played a lot of those places, but, um, and I played some super value and in the back of the book, you know, list like my best value public courses and stuff like that, you know, things that were generally under, under 50 bucks. And I thought were just as good as, you know, most of the courses I played. So, um, you know, that's, it's a whole, that's a whole wonderful golf world that, is i mean that's the growth area if if we look at like like it's not the country club scene um where the next where millennials are going to um are are going to grow golf they're going to go grow, golf is growing in um in these in public golf courses and accessible golf courses in golf clubs that are not attached to um clubhouses or or courses things like the new club um, there are many of them now, the flyers, Club, like what, whatever these, these sort of golf clubs that exist online and in chat rooms and in, and, and threads and all that, no laying up, like whatever, like these golf communities that are not, they, they are taking the place of the grill room that, that was my dad's generation. And it's probably mine, mine's, I guess, probably between the two. Um, so, you know, golf's that's, that's where things are going to grow and, and, and golf courses need to catch on to the fact that like 
there's a ton of young golfers who want to come play your golf course, but you know what? They don't want to pay 50 grand to join. So um, let's figure out how to make that work for everybody. Yeah, and just, and just trying to also spread the awareness to, you know, not that we're trying to convert people to, you know, to all become golfers, but it's funny when, you know, anyone who knows me knows that I play golf. I'm like, oh, I live in the Bay Area. And then the number one thing I get is, oh, you played Olympic? And I'm like, well, no. But also, like, even if I had, like, just the fact that like golf equals Olympic club, like at least for me, it's like, look, if someone invites me to Olympic club, would love to play there. Yeah. But again, it's a lot more of like rooster run as opposed to Olympic club. And that's where, again, I don't, it's not our job to convert non golfers to think that way. But I think that's to your point, what's so ingrained in our psyches is like, you know, Philly cricket club, which I'm sure is amazing. Right. Like mm-hmm. I know you and Randy played there, but I'm just saying like, it's the rooster runs like, Hey, like there's, you know, great, great places that yeah. Olympics amazing, but that's one, ex- you know, that's top one, one, one percent, you know, yeah. but also Olympic. So if someone's coming to the city and they want to play, play golf, you know, one question I ask them is, are you trying to get a golf experience with the most pristine course or the best views and atmosphere that you're going to get at a golf course? Because if I take you to the 17th hole at Lincoln park, I mean, that's the best view you're going to get at any golf course in the in the entire city. I mean, you get yeah. a mm-hmm. beautiful view of the bridge. It's it's just incredible. And no matter how much you pay to be a member at Olympic and and Lake Merced and the whole you know routing of all the different courses that they have in in San Francisco, you're just never going to get the Legion of Honor and the the views you're going to get from Lincoln Park. The track is is absolute dog shit. And we're, we're going to be the first people to, to admit that. But the locals love it. it it's part of the San Francisco bucks. championship. It's 40 bucks. So if you want to make it to Harding Park, you have to play the dog track of Lincoln Park. And it's just that juxtaposition to where you have to play such a horrendously kept course. But fun design to make it to the championship at Harding Park is just... I think one of the coolest championships you're going to get. It's a chef's kiss. It's a chef's yes. kiss. Yeah. No, that's awesome. That's the uh, and the San Francisco championship is such a cool. Um, it's such a cool thing. You know, I wish the. Uh, I mean, Philly has a public association that that does have sort of have a city championship, but it wouldn't be like it would not be known like the the San Francisco. Well, because and you also because you have an anchor like Harding Park, which is nice. Um, we we need a public anchor. Uh, I mean, New York has Beth Page. There's a there's a push here to that we'll have one from when Cobb's Creek in Philadelphia is being, which is a Hugh Wilson design, his only other design outside of Marion, and it's being the money is I think there, and they've got the lease from the city, and and so that the plans are for to turn that into like a Beth Page or an East Lake kind of situation, and um and and as a community golf course with a with a championship. Um, a championship caliber so that that would be um uh, a, a nice anchor like that and maybe we can have our our city championship but i think that's that's so cool um you know and uh and there's a good and california has a good has a good public scene you know that was probably i played more um publics than than privates if I, I don't know if i'd have to look but i played a fair number of, of public golf courses it's a funny thing like too because they're two different very they can be like very divide different communities and almost like with with very little awareness of one another um which kind of sucks because like so like with like i've gotten some criticism in the america book where people are like oh you just went to like all these fancy places and like places i could never go and then on the other side, I've gotten criticism from someone, a few people who thought, um, you sort of thumbed your nose at like the, the, uh, the establishment or the, or too tough on, you know, people on the country club people like as being, um, elitist or something. I'm like, Jesus, man, I can't win. Like which way, which way do you want it? Like, I, I didn't think I really did either, but, um, it's, you know, people identify with golf differently and um see it through different lenses so as being too elitist or as being um something else and so anyway um it tried to strike the balance uh of playing accessible places but i you know in telling the story of golf in america and trying to tell the story of golf in america you can't really do it 
without visiting <laughs> private golf courses because that is part of the story of golf in America. I mean, America is a capitalistic, you know, country. And so without the private side, to be honest, I don't think the public side would thrive as much as it does. And, you know, us as public golfers, we, we're always striving to, to, to want these public courses to allow us to have access. You know, growing up in the Bay Area, I think I was spoiled and there was never a reason for me to join a, pub, a private course because I had so much access. You know, I grew up in San Jose, really close to Coyote Creek and Cinnabar Hills. And, you know, I was surrounded by some great public tracks. Yeah. And but one thing that always drove me crazy is whenever I would go to Monterey and play any junior events and stuff while I was growing up, we would drive past Cyprus. And mm-hmm. I never saw anybody ever playing Cyprus. <laughs> I would stop, I would look over the fence, I would, you know, do my little peek cuz it always intrigued me. It's always that course that's there. It's so close, I could touch it, but I'm never going to step foot on that course. It just the rarity of me getting the invite to actually get out there and play it is probably so minuscule and not seeing anybody play it broke my heart that they couldn't just open that course up for two weeks out of the year do a raffle charge a thousand dollars a person to come out and play it i don't care what levels you want to put on there but it killed me not to have any any access and knowing for the foreseeable future that that's never going to change you know, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting in your lifetime. If It almost feels like that's going to have to change. Um, and like you said, is it a two-week thing? Is it two hours on a Tuesday? Is it, you know, that people are just going to have a, have a chance because there's a generation of golfers that I think are going to grow up and just not be that impressed by the fact that, wow, you don't let anyone play there. Good for you. You know, like that's the, <laughs> where where I grew up, I suppose, you know, and I grew up near Pine Valley and there was always, and that was, there was a great mystique to the fact that it's like, you can't get on there, so it must be good. And I wonder if in the next 20 and 30 years, if it's like, oh, you can't get on there? Well, you're, you're, then you don't get to be on the in the conversation. And it'll be interesting to see what happens. And may, maybe I'm wrong. I mean, maybe golf golf is slow to change for sure. Um, but you look at a place like Palmetto, right, in, in, out, in Aiken outside Augusta. And so during Masters Week, they go from being a private golf course to an exclusively public golf course. No members are allowed to play that week. It is open to the public. It's not probably the easiest tee time to get because the whole world is in, in is half an hour away in Mast at, at Augusta. But you know, you pay your it's expensive. You know, three fifty for a spot, but you get to play one of the best golf courses in the South, and probably feel like you went and just played Augusta, and uh, and have an awesome day and be a member for a day. And they do that for the whole week. And I bet I mean God, I can't imagine how much they rake. Um, and in terms of like, that's, it probably covers their nut for the year. And, uh, so it works for them and it works for golf and it just makes sense. And it's like, why, you know, it's not that hard. It's not that hard. Um, so I feel like that's, it it just makes too much sense. And I, I think golf, um, the, you know, the next generation and the, and, and folks of your generation, uh, see that and see that golf can make more sense. Um, and, and can do simple things like that. So we'll see. It'll be interesting. Yeah, well, we, we even see it here. I mean, I'm, I, don't know, I don't know if you've played there, Tom. I'm sure you have. Pasa Tiempo, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. like, I, we played there. I mean, Chris has played there before. He has not played there post-renovation, but we played there, like, late May and just had, like, the best day. And, you know, we were talking about it. And, you know, the thing was amazing. You know, the course was unbelievable. The merch was cheap. You know, we had this wonderful day, but walking out of there, I was thinking, I was like, wow, okay, think about how advantageous this is for them, right? We we just collectively, between drinks, food, tea times, merch, just dropped like $1,100 amongst three of us. Mm-hmm. We're all going to wear these visors doing marketing for your course. We're going to go talk about this, right? Like, we can't wait to come back next year. And also, like, to your point, we're underwriting your membership dues. We're only going to be able to come once a year, and all we're going to do is just talk about Pasa Tiempo nonstop for the next year. What am I missing? Yeah. Right? Like, I don't, I don't know what I'm missing here. Like, <laughs> exactly. Right? Yeah. Uh, until, uh, I suppose it's like, when it gets to the point 
where to be in the rankings, you're going to have to start let let actual golfers go to your golf course. <laughs> Matt might have something to do with it, like not just this this Raiders thing where, okay, we'll have a couple Raiders out and they'll they'll say nice things about us. Or I, and I don't know how some of these golf courses remain in the top ten when nobody's played them. Right? It's funny. Um, so maybe when it gets to the point where it's like, hey, you know, you actually have to have golfers play your golf course besides your members um, to, to be rated. And that would be the difference of like the go- the ratings in the UK and Ireland. Um, when you look at those ratings, those golf courses get played by everybody. Everybody's played them. They're not hiding. They're, they're, you can come out and see yeah. us and see if we belong on, on, a, on a ranking or not. And I'm not saying that Augusta and those courses are hiding. They're certainly not. Um, sure. But it wouldn't wouldn't it be cool to like um, have like like you said you know have a, a time or a couple of weeks where you could have some people come out and uh, and basically sing your praises. <laughs> it would seem it makes it makes too much sense. So yeah, we'll see. Yeah, times they are a changing. Crazy. I'm hoping so. And I think even with our generation, so we have a few friends that are members at courses out here, and I won't name names to blow them up, but, um, you know, they're, they're members of some of the more prestigious courses that we have in the area. In the difference between, you know, a member that you meet that might be, you know, a little bit older or, you know, has been tenured in there and these newer kids in their late 20s, early 30s joining their, their first clubs, they want to share the experience with everybody. Our yeah. buddies that are members literally want us to come so out generous. as many times as we possibly can to, so they can showcase the course that they have fallen in love with. And I think that's that's something that's going to change where those guys are going to start joining the boards of these clubs. And they're going to be like, we need to share this with the world. There's no reason that we're holding this all to ourselves. Let's make this easier on ourselves. Yeah, that's another thing you see changing at private clubs is that in my father's generation, you joined a private club, you were mixed in and initiated with the members, you were became part, uh, you show up on a Saturday morning, you would get a game. That was the pro's job was to get you in, you know, integrated with the Saturday morning game and the Sunday, whatever, and the when the men's day, Wednesday and all that stuff. So like you didn't, your golf community was always the members at the club where you belonged, And that's still obviously the case at a lot of places, but there's a lot of young guys now who join a club and pretty much, you know, their golf community exists in other places like online or, um, and, and they, they're bringing their friends constantly. Like, so that, that experience of like, yeah, I mean, I have a friend at Philly cricket who, yeah, he's, he has friends there that he plays with, but he probably plays definitely more than half of his golf with guests, uh, with me and, 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 and our friends. And so, um, wouldn't it be nice if that was more affordable? Wouldn't it be nice if, um, there was a chance to just have visitors without it, um, breaking the bank all the time. So, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see as younger golfers start taking over golf courses and boards um, if it remains uh, so ex- – if what happens with the notion of golf as an exclusive thing in America. Because um, it's just not exclusive in Scotland and Ireland, and, and they seem to be okay. They're, they're getting by fine, you know, somehow. Somehow they're still playing golf. We hope you enjoyed part one of our chat with Tom Coyne. Tune in next week to hear the rest of the stories he shared with our favorite municipals.